Emmanuel Church family and friends. I greet you today with some very exciting news. Next week, Sunday, August 9th, Pastor Rich and I would like to invite you to join us for communion. We are going to be offering drive-by communion. So how it's going to play out, well, you'll, ent you'll be entering off of Walnut Street into the main large parking lot and then drive through the smaller parking lot where we'll greet you here at the front door have that intimate time of communion with you, and then you can exit here onto Fifth Avenue. Pastor Rich's regular message will be um, still being played on YouTube, so you can connect with him for Marlene's uh, prelude and postlude, as well as Rich's message. Uh, but then for a special time of communion, if you feel comfortable coming out, um, then join us between 10 o'clock and noon on August 9th um, for that special time together. We certainly hope you can join us. I have one special prayer request today, and that is for Dennis and Cindy and their family. Cindy's father passed away last week, and we want to extend our sympathy to Cindy and her family. We also want to ask for prayers for Cindy as she has been diagnosed with the COVID virus. Um, although she is not having any kind of major symptoms, uh, it was really found out after the death of her father. And so she is currently in quarantine, um, but not having any symptoms. But we certainly want to keep Cindy in our prayers, as well as Dennis and the rest of the family. So um, we know that everybody's going through a lot of health challenges right now, and we've offered up a few in the past couple weeks. Um, all of those people are recovering at home and doing well. Um, but for those of you who we may not be aware of any of your health concerns, just know we are keeping all of our church family members in our prayers regularly. So in closing, uh, the fact that you're listening right now shows that you are listening on, on Sunday mornings and we are very grateful that you're taking the time out of your schedules to connect with, with our church family via this YouTube video. Um, but I also want to just encourage those of you who might find some extra time on your hands and be looking for a little extra spiritual lift throughout the week to remind you that Pastor Rich also offers a message on Wednesdays. And uh, the message that he offers is our typical through the Bible message. Uh, but this past week just really spoke to me and many people in regards to the fact that it had to do with spiritual giving. And of course, it's, it's that message that always encourages people to continue to give and give generously of not only um, their financial contributions, but of their time and talents. But I wanted to also just encourage you to listen to it and take that moment to reflect on the fact that this church is doing amazing in regards to spiritual giving. When I think about everything that we've been able to accomplish since uh, the shutdown, how many months ago, uh, the different uh, housekeeping things that have taken place, the different service opportunities that we've been engaged with. Um, I, I applaud all of you and I thank you from the bottom of my heart for your continued support, your generosity, your love and your kindness. And I really just can't say enough how much I encourage you to listen to that message uh, with an open mind and an open heart, um, but also to know how much we appreciate you within that message. Um, your generosity, as I said, your giving in the past and your continued love and support. So on that note, um, I hope this finds you all doing well. That's it for today. Again, I hope I can see you next week um, for our drive-by communion. And in the meantime, just be well, be safe, and know that if you need anything, I will do my best to help serve you Monday through Thursday between nine and three. God be with you. Greetings, members and friends of Emmanuel United Church of Christ. I welcome you this eighth Sunday of Ordinary Time as we delve into a wonderful story about one of the founding fathers of the nation of Israel, a story that has to do with wrestling with God, something that we all do at some time in our lives and perhaps for much of our lives. So we're going to be looking at this wonderful sacred story, and in order to introduce us to this story, I want to invite you to join me in a call to worship. If you will, the words that are bold, I invite you to respond with or just listen in. Just when we are feeling most discouraged, 
God burst into our lives with healing mercy. Lord, listen to our hearts, our cries, our prayers. Give us peace and hope in our spirits. Direct us in ways of service in your name. And this week I'd like to add an opening prayer. In the darkness of night and the brightness of day, you, O Lord, are present to us. As we wrestle with situations which seem to drain us of our energy, as we struggle to find out who you call us to be, you reach out to us with reassurance of empowerment and courage for the days ahead. Calm our spirits and prepare our hearts and lives to receive your awesome grace. It is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. And in the same prayerful spirit, we approach this story from Genesis 32, verses 22 through 31. The same night, Jacob got up and took his two wives, his two maids, and his eleven children, and crossed the ford of the Jabbok. He took them and sent them across the stream, and likewise everything that he had. Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until daybreak. When the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he struck him on the hip socket, and Jacob's hit was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. Then he said, Let me go, for the day is breaking. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. So he said to him, What is your name? And he said, Jacob. Then the man said, You shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel. For you have striven with God and with humans and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked him, Please tell me your name. But he said, Why is it that you ask my name? And there he blessed him. So Jacob called the place Peniel, saying, For I have seen God face to face, and yet my life is preserved. The sun rose upon him as he passed Peniel, limping because of his hip. That is the story we will be looking at in a message titled, quite simply, Wrestling with God. Now, our nation has its founding fathers, and we celebrate those founding fathers and feel a certain connection to them. And the people of Israel also had their founding fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, whose stories are communicated to us in the book of Genesis. Important foundational stories for the people of Israel and for their identity. You had Abraham, the founding father, whose name means the father of nations, the one whom God had established a covenant with and said, I will bless you, Abraham, and I will make of you a great nation, and your seed will be a blessing to all the nations. Abraham gave birth to Isaac, whose name means laughter, because he was a child granted to Sarah in her old age to fulfill God's promise. And then our third patriarch is Jacob, whose name means deceiver. He's the one in our story whose name will be changed from Jacob the deceiver to Israel, which means he who struggles or strives with God. Now, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were all faithful, but they all had skeletons because this is a rather dysfunctional family tree. We know that Abraham lied about Sarah, putting her life at risk. We know that Isaac played favorites with his sons, preferring Esau to Jacob and thus frustrating Jacob. We know that Jacob was called deceiver for good reason. He was an ambitious con man, willing to do anything to get the upper hand and gain blessing for himself. And this is our story where Jacob the deceiver's name is changed. And it takes place at a time when he's alone and frightened and God turns up to pick a fight. And Jacob wins the fight, but in the course of things loses his name and is wounded by God in the process and walks away with a lifelong limp. Now, to order, in order to understand this account and what's really going on here, we need to know about Jacob's past, and it is quite an interesting past. He is one of two twin brothers. He was born seconds after his brother Esau, and he, as an infant, was grasping the heel of his brother's foot as he came out of his mother's womb. 
And thus he was named the grasper or the deceiver, the one who is at the heels of another. And we see from the beginning, Jacob is a fighter. He's grasping hold of what he wants in life. And this grasping of Esau is just the beginning of a tug of war between him and Esau, which will actually just take a huge bulk of his life, which will be defined by his rivalry with his twin Esau, being born second by only seconds meant that his inheritance would be paltry compared to the firstborn Esau. Esau, as the oldest son, just by seconds, would receive a double share and greater honor in the family. And to add to Jacob's frustration, not would he, only would he receive a lesser inheritance, but from his earliest days, he knew the sadness of being his father's least favorite son, because Esau was certainly Isaac's favorite son. So that Jacob and Esau had this fierce sibling rivalry that was intensified not just by their own personalities, by their nature, but by their parents' favoritism, by nurture. We read in Genesis 25, Isaac loved Esau, but Rebekah loved Jacob. Isaac loved Esau, whose name means Harry. And he fitted the stereotype of a man's man in the ancient world. He was outdoorsy, physical, a hunter who won favor with his father, who loved to dine on wild game. Jacob, on the other hand, was quiet and intellectual, a mother's boy in many ways, much like I am. And it was inevitable that the rivalry between them would turn ugly. And of course, we have the great stories where Jacob tricks Esau out of his birthright because he offers Esau, when he's hungry, a cup of stew, and Esau is quite ready to give up his birthright. And then, of course, in the first case of identity theft, Jacob tricks Isaac into blessing him by pretending to be Esau. Jacob does many underhanded things against his brother Esau. And of course, once this deception is uncovered, the manly man Esau is enraged and he vows to kill Jacob. And with his life threatened by his hunter brother, who certainly had no problem killing things, Jacob flees to Mesopotamia for refuge. And he finds himself a refugee at a young age on the run, far from home, and he collapses in exhaustion. And it's at that point in Genesis 28, we read of a wonderful story that we're all familiar with of Jacob's ladder. Jacob, being vulnerable, exhausted, on the run, has this dream of a ladder or a stairway that connects heaven and earth. And there he hears the voice of God say to him these words, Jacob, know that I am with you and I will keep you wherever you go, and I will bring you back to this land, to your home, for I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. Jacob is assured that God is with him, and Jacob essentially says, you know, God was with me. I didn't even know it, and he establishes a memorial there and says, this is the gate of heaven, the house of God. He has every reason to believe that he's on his own, and yet he realizes, perhaps for the very first time, that God is with him, and he makes a vow to God saying, God, if you will be with me and you will keep my life, I will come back to my father's house in peace, and you then shall be my God. But at this point, he's still on the run from Esau, and so he arrives at his uncle Laban's, and the first thing that happens is he falls head over heels in love with the beautiful Rachel. Rachel has a father, however, whose name is Laban, and Laban is a deceiver, just like Jacob. And Jacob will find that Laban is someone who is his match. Jacob the deceiver will be deceived by Laban. He will taste his own medicine because Laban will trick Jacob into marrying two wives, into marrying first Leah because no one will want her, at least that's what Laban assumes. And, and so he says, if you work for seven years, I'll give you Rachel, but you need to work another seven years. And it's this long 
convoluted story about how Jacob has to spend 14 years just to gain the hand of marriage of Rachel. And then once he has Rachel and Leah as his wives, there's conflicts over childbearing and two more wives are added. And you have this incredible dysfunctional family and many sons are born, 12 in all. And these become the 12 sons of Israel once Jacob's name is changed to Israel. It is a messy situation. It is a dysfunctional situation. But after 20 years, Jacob finally decides to come back home. And as he is heading back home, he realizes that Esau may still want to kill him. And so he sends a message to Esau, and he hears that Esau is coming with 400 men. And all he can assume is that Esau is coming with an army to kill him. And so in the early verses of the chapter we're looking at today, chapter 32, Jacob decides to send gifts in advance to Esau. So he sends over 550 animals to Esau. And then he organizes his family from his least favorite wives and sons to his most favorite wives and sons. He's a bit of a rogue. He, he has some edges. He hasn't learned from the favoritism of his own parents. And so he sends the least favorite first as a buffer. He saves his favorites for last until the last person remaining is Jacob's true favorite, himself. He will go last. And he's left alone. And he's vulnerable. And he's afraid. Just like 20 years before when he dreamed the vision of Jacob's ladder. And it's at this point when he's at his most vulnerable that God shows up and attacks. And a wrestling match begins. Now, God shows up not in all God's glory. This is a real struggle, but it's being told to us in a way that it's done at twilight. Jacob can't see the face. There's a certain humility of God approaching Jacob in this way. But there's a wrestling match that occurs all night long. And if you know anything about wrestling, and I used to wrestle for one year. I was very unsuccessful. Three minutes on a mat with an opponent is exhausting. But Jacob wrestled with God until daybreak, the whole night long. And we see he who grasped the heels, the deceiver, Jacob with his gritty determination and dogged persistence, true to his name as the ankle grabber, still refusing to let go until finally, when the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he struck him on his hip socket and Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. Jacob becomes totally helpless because of the excruciating pain of a dislocated hip, and yet he still refuses to let go. The man says, let me go, the day is breaking, but Jacob says, I will not let you go unless you bless me. He's gonna grasp even further, true to his name, he will fight for the blessing if it's the last thing he does. And at an odd moment, the man then says to him, what is your name? And this is the moment of truth, because Jacob honestly replies, my name is Jacob, which means deceiver. That is what he is. In this moment of truth, he's forced to confront his past. His name is synonymous with his lifetime of cheating and deceiving and grasping. His name is fitting for who he is and how he has lived. But the man who represents God's presence says to him, Jacob's no longer going to be your name. Your name is going to be Israel, for you've strived with God and have prevailed. Jacob's name is changed to Israel, no longer the deceiver but the one who strives and wrestles with God. If his old name reflected his old character of struggling and grasping and deceiving, his new name will now represent his new character. He's been wrestling with God his whole life, not just this one night, but his whole life. And now he is being shown that all he has been doing has been guided and directed by God that Jacob might learn to wrestle with God and cling to God no matter what occurs. And it's at this point that God blesses Jacob and the deceiver and grasper 
becomes the wrestler, the God wrestler, the God struggler. Jacob knows the meaning of the event. He has been wrestling with God. And that's why he names the place Peniel, which means the face of God. And he knows that God has allowed him to win. He says, I have seen God face to face, and yet my life is preserved. Which is to say, this wrestling match from the beginning has not been a fair fight. The participants are not equally matched. This wrestling match could have been over in milliseconds, and Jacob now realizes it's only by the grace of God that he's still breathing. Jacob knows that he's experienced what I as a father did with my young children. My children as toddlers, I'd wrestle with them, I'd hold back, and I'd sometimes even let them win. I did that out of love for them because I loved them so and I wanted to relate to them and I wanted to be the person who engaged with them in a very uh, loving and intimate way in some kind of playful fun. Jacob is experiencing that same kind of engagement with God. God is holding back and allowing Jacob to win in order to gain the blessing. And yet, because we're dealing with God, Jacob will forever be marked by this struggle. He will walk away with a limp for the remainder of his life because this blessing that he demands comes at a cost. And he had to lose a part of himself in order to be remade. But he walks away with a new name and a new identity, with the name of Israel, he who has wrestled with God and overcome to receive a blessing. For this name is his true God-given identity. Not Jacob the deceiver, Jacob the wrestler. Not Jacob the grasper, but Jacob the one who persists in order to receive the blessing. And with this new identity, marked by his struggle with God, he will limp away to meet Esau. And you can read the remainder of the story, but this picture gives you an idea that all ends well. Now that's our story. And what I find amazing about this story is it allows us to see that when we wrestle with God, we're in the same camp that Jacob one of the forefathers of our faith is in. Because we're all on a similar journey throughout our lifetime. We're all wrestling with who we are. Are we the deceiver, the sinner, or are we the one who strives with God in order to overcome and receive blessing? We all, like Jacob, wrestle with our own nature and with our own dysfunctional environments, dysfunctional families, selfish actions rooted in a deceptive world. We all have been engaged in deceptions which can cause so much trouble, and yet God continues to engage Jacob in spite of all that he does, which is why I love this quote from Krish Kandia, who writes, those of us from or in dysfunctional families are not disqualified from inclusion in God's plans. Whether we are by nature prickly or selfish, physical or intellectual, chip on shouldered by favoritism or predisposed to competitiveness, there is hope. Even if we are at times disappointed with God, God is not disappointed with us. God knows from the outset how messed up we are, both by nature and by nurture. And Jacob, in spite of all of his challenges, both within and without, is one who wrestles with God and refuses to let go, just as we wrestle. We wrestle with things like this COVID situation we're in. We wrestle with poverty and with violence and with injustice and self-doubt. We wrestle with unrealized goals and dreams and pressures that we lay on ourselves and burdens that we carry. It took Jacob decades to finally come to terms with God and with himself. And it was only after great sorrow and disappointment and fear and loss. And all along the way, God patiently waited in order to strike at the right moment. And what I find interesting here is 
that old saying about Aslan, the lion in C.S. Lewis's Narnia books who represents Jesus or God, that Aslan is good, but not safe. And in the same way, God waits and strikes because sometimes things seem to get worse, not better, when God shows up. And again, there is cause for comfort in this, which Scott Sauls points out, which perhaps will give some of you some encouragement. He writes, to my comfort, the Jacob story confirms that wrestling in the middle of the night, experiencing disequilibrium and restless thoughts and self-doubt and insomnia and an overall disposition of insecurity might be more a sign of spiritual vitality than it is a sign of being spiritually lost. It might be more a sign of being spiritually full than it is a sign of being spiritually empty. The Jacob story gives me hope that when I am wrestling and feeling disoriented and secure, God could be more near than God is far away. And of course, the key to our story and of Jacob receiving the blessing is he refuses to let go of God. And it's in that sense that I think perhaps we need to have another version of that wonderful footsteps poem, which all of us has heard as someone looks back over a beach and the footsteps represent their life and they look back and they see two sets of footprint most of the time, but then in the hardest times of their lives, they see one set. And the person asks the Lord, why is it that there's only one set of footprints? And the Lord says, well, it was then that I carried you. Well, perhaps we could add another spin to the story, because at Jacob's most difficult time, God didn't carry him. God pounced and left him permanently wounded so that Jacob's footstep trail would show a man limping through the sand which is why I want to end with a quote from one of my favorite theologians, Terence Freetheim. When it comes to struggles in daily life, we can count on God's mixing it up with us, challenging us, convicting us, evaluating us, judging us. We may have to place our life at risk, knowing that the one who loses life will find it. But God honors the relationship, both by engaging in the struggle in the first place and by persisting in that struggle through thick, and thin. And of course, we know in light of our New Testament that God fully enters into our struggle in Christ Jesus, who bears the marks of that, who bears the wounds of crucifixion, because God wants to wrestle us, not to defeat us, but to bless us. And it's only those who refuse to let go who experience the full blessing. In response to our message, I want to invite you to join me in a word of prayer. Lord, we have heard the story of Jacob as he wrestled with the angel, how he asked for the angel to bless him. We too come to you for blessing. There are so many times in our lives in which we have felt alienated, downtrodden, alone. It is easy for us to wallow in our misery, to whine about all the perceived injustices that have been heaped upon us, but you encourage us to stand strong, to seek the blessings that you've provided for us, to recognize the many ways that you are with us, giving us strength and courage. Be with us again, precious Lord. Guide our lives as we have brought our prayers before you for those near and dear to us, seeking healing and hope for them. Let us also remember that those same mercies are lavished upon us, not because we deserve them, but because of your great and generous love for us and for all. Help us receive these blessings and in turn be a blessing to someone else. For we ask these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. O oh God, hear our cries for those who hunger and those who are full, for those who need you desperately and those who feel no need for you, for those who wrestle with the impact of being your blessed children, for those who are unaware of your offered blessing, and for concerns that are too difficult to express. Hear our cries, O God of our salvation. Faithful God, in grateful response to your love revealed in Christ, we stand together with all your saints throughout the world, praying as you've taught us. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, 
on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, as always, I hope something said here has provoked some thought, raised some questions, um, pushed you in a way that you might wrestle with God even more with the uh, bold awareness that that's not a bad place to be in. That may be exactly where God wants us to be. It's not a sign of doubt or disbelief. It may be a sign of us taking God most seriously. And of course, if we're wounded in the process, it may just simply be that that is part of God's refashioning us and reshaping us. I don't know what there is in this story for you. I know the few things that there is in it for me. And I know that I just love the fact that God, like a tender parent, will engage so intimately, so passionately with God's people in order to draw them to God's self, in order that they then might be a blessing to others, because that's exactly what will happen as Jacob approaches Esau, and there's a wonderful renewal of friendship and love, something that perhaps had never, ever been there before, because Jacob the deceiver is now Jacob the wrestler, the struggler. And of course, that identity will typify and symbolize the people of God as the people of Israel for the entirety of the Old Testament. And of course, that is our inheritance as the people of Christ Jesus. So again, I hope something here said was encouraging or inspiring. Um, grateful for your prayerful support and love as we continue to move through these difficult summer months. And until we connect again, I want to leave you with this benediction. May the love of God the Father, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the blessed fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. Amen.